Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. So one of the biggest challenges with starting out in no-till is that there is an overwhelming amount of information out there now about how to garden, but not all of it is gonna make sense in your context. Because what I do here in my gardens in semi-subtropical Kentucky may not be what you need to do in your arid desert or your colder region or even in other parts of Kentucky. So today we are going to discuss how to design the right no-till system for your context. So let's do it. So you will hear the phrase a lot that context is everything in farming, but to be honest, that's a rather unhelpful idea if you don't know what your context is exactly. And I know that evaluation of context has to be one of the more boring ideas I've pitched on YouTube, but it's critically important to knowing how to manage your land. Farming is not exactly a choose your own adventure type of well, adventure, but more like a let your farm choose your adventure for you type of adventure. So that's what we're going to do today, which may very well save you not only time, but also keep a few shiny dollar bills in your pocket and out of the swear jar. But first, I want to tell you about our friends over at High Country News. High Country News is an independent, nonprofit publication that has been covering the Western United States for more than 50 years. They provide unique on the ground reporting on the land, water, wildlife, and communities of the region with dedicated coverage of climate, environmental, and indigenous issues. Sign up for free newsletters or a trial of the magazine at hcn.org slash no till. Okay, so step one to avoiding or possibly fixing a no till disaster is indeed to determine what you're working with. Now, these are not necessarily in order of importance because all of them are important. No way around it. All of these things are going to have an effect on what no-till system you choose or use or possibly discontinue using. So first, let's just start with the soil type, but more so soil conditions. You see sandier soils, for instance, tend to be lower in organic matter, lower in available nutrients, and drain more readily than other soil types, but that isn't a universal given. I've seen very healthy sandy soils, and I've also seen the opposite, which is to say sandy soils that do not drain well and are slightly compacted, going against what we typically think of with sandy soils. Clay soils, for their part, can be impertinent jerk faces, if you'll excuse a little bit of jargon, but can also be rich with nutrients and quite healthy. Conversely, they can be deplete of nutrients and exceedingly difficult to work with, insisting on being either extremely wet or extremely dry, seemingly incapable of just being, you know, usable. So to judge your soil condition, start with a simple soil test to get an idea of what your soil organic matter is and if there are any wild imbalances in nutrients. Uh, second, do a percolation test to see if you have a drainage issue. This involves digging a hole and then filling that hole with water. Allow that water to drain, then fill it again. If the water does not drain, that second filling up within 24 hours, then you have a drainage issue. This has to be done in the growing season when the soil is not already excessively wet, like it can be in the winter, at least for us. Uh, drainage can be a sign of compaction, but also a high water table. There is not a lot you can do about a high water table. Uh, you will want to build beds a little bit higher and you will want to increase your soil organic matter and, or find a different place to have your garden. Compaction, however, can be addressed. To check for compaction, uh, use a piece of rebar or something similar and plunge it into the soil when it's at a normal moisture level. If it's hard to get the rebar in and it stops a few inches down, that's compaction. If you get several inches in, you may be able to get away with not doing anything to address the compaction beforehand. And I've discussed all of this in like this particular video, which is all about starting gardens. Now, compaction, drainage, all these things, why does all that matter to no-till? Because if you are wanting to use a deep compost slash no-dig system, for instance, then just pouring compost over top of poorly draining, heavily compacted soil could require a year or more to really get going, no matter if it's sand or clay. Working some nutrients and compost into the soil and then forming those beds with compost, for instance, will get you into healthy production much faster and much better. So mechanical tillage or time, those are basically your options for rough soil conditions. Remember, even in a deep compost setup, plants are still going to rely heavily on the native soil below the compost for nutrition. So maybe don't feed and house them in muck. I should note that every time I talk about getting gardens set up with working compost in, someone will inevitably say in the comments that mechanical tillage is always bad. But dogmas like that blur realities because when you're dealing with native soils that look like this, there is just nothing there to protect. Almost no life, no organic matter, nothing really that you need to protect except for the soil particles themselves. So my suggestion is to simply put something there worth protecting. 
Now, if you're dealing with this, obviously, you know, don't till that. In that case, if you have soil that's really nice or even moderately nice, you can just go ahead and lay your cardboard or whatever down and then your compost and build beds that way. Rough soil though, you may want to address it. Okay, next in thinking about no-till systems and context, rainfall and climate. Rainfall matters in the sense that if you are anything like us here in semi-subtropical Kentucky, you not only get 40 to 70 inches of rain per year, uh, but sometimes that rain can come in quite heavy downpours. On a slope, that can wash out any compost or loose soil uh, quite easily. So in heavier rainfall areas, you have to have a strategy for retaining composts, uh, wood chips, or any loose soil like in a system that uses the tilther, for instance. Uh, as an example, we do not use wood chips in most of our pathways because they just wash out or onto the beds. In drier, more arid regions, however, or areas where you get a lot of rain, but it just kind of casually spits out of the sky all day long, like maybe in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, then wood chips can be a great option. We also avoid compost mulches in low-lying areas uh, on the slope because it will also wash away, which is not only an expensive sight to behold, but can be pollution if it makes its way to a stream or some other waterway. Uh, in terms of other climactic factors, straw and hay and cover crop residue are classic mulches, but they can also cool the soil. So if you're in a really cold climate, using those mulches is going to be more complicated because they can prevent the soil from ever reaching a good summer temperature for growing summer crops. But if that's what you got, then those lightly colored mulches may benefit from some assistance with something like a tarp to help warm the soil. To use an opposite example, in very hot climates, compost mulches can be complicated depending on the crops you grow because, well, dark things absorb more sunlight, which means compost gets really freaking hot right around where the roots are. Watch our mulch breakdown for more on all the nuances of the different mulch or mulches, or pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook for a really detailed breakdown of literally everything I talk about on this channel. And when you get it from notillgrowers.com, it helps to support more videos, so that's awesome. Next up, context-wise, is your scale will have a lot to say in the no-till system that you use. If you're trying to grow on 10 or 20 acres, well, that's a lot of compost for deep composting. You may want to split up the acreage between a couple or even a few different no-till strategies and put your more profitable, more weed-prone crops in the compost mulch and manage the longer season stuff with cover crops, hay, straw, or leaf mulches or something else like that. That's what we do on our farm. Uh, we split it between two different systems, largely because covering everything in compost is expensive and not every crop can recoup that expense. In terms of scale, I recommend always trying to grow into a larger scale rather than having to scale back. So start small. A farm that's too small is always going to be more profitable and easier to manage than a farm that's too big. Or at least I'd personally always prefer to have more demand than supply. Uh, the opposite can be a huge waste of time, money, food, and swear words. They're expensive around my farm. Next thing for determining if you are using the right or wrong no-till system, available materials. What you have around you or don't have around you can be a huge determining factor in the no-till system you use. If you're having to ship $100 a yard compost from a thousand miles away, well, maybe that's not the best system for you or, you know, the planet. But maybe you have the raw ingredients to make compost and you can borrow or share a tractor. Maybe you know a good hay producer or a grain grower who would be honest about when and what they spray. As an aside, real quick, I'm not adding neighbors as part of the context here, but neighbors are a huge part of your context. Neighbors can make or break the quality of your farm and farm life. Good neighbors make things so much easier. And bad neighbors, well, um, I'll let the comment section let you know about that. Anyway, there may be materials uh, near you that don't exist near me, like seaweed for nutrients, or marsh hay for mulch, or excess wool, or who knows what the wasted carbon or nitrogen might be in your area. In fact, maybe help me by listing a few uh, interesting off-the-beaten-path materials that you have access to that may not be on other folks' radar. Like any quest, you have to use what's around you. I learned that from the movie Onward which is largely an allegory about how we've lost our connection to nature and magic and dragons. Anyway, like I alluded to a minute ago, what you plan to grow and how much will say a lot about your no-till system as well. For instance, if you intend to grow sweet corn for market, then deep compost is probably never going to pencil out unless you produce all the compost yourself. And even then it's probably questionable because sweet corn is just such a low yielding, low profit crop. But if you are planning to grow lettuces and radishes and other higher profit crops like those, then maybe deep compost makes sense. Also profitability aside, certain no-till systems don't make sense for certain crops. Like if you want to direct seed a bunch of stuff like carrots, well, hay is not really gonna work. 
One, for the weed seeds, and two, because it's hard to seed into thick carbonaceous mulches. Compost mulch done with a decent nutritional compost, on the other hand, works amazingly well for carrots because it's easy to seed into and suppress weeds, and the carrots just come right up into it. And so you get a really nice clean stand of carrots. Low and no mulch no-till systems that work sizable amounts of compost into the top two or four inches or so of the soil are often employed for baby greens and the like because the germination is so easy. With compost mulches, uh, germination can be trickier because some mulchier composts absolutely abhor water, seemingly meaning that seeds have a harder time getting what they need to germinate and staying moist enough. Local regulations and restrictions and HOAs or homeowner annoyances? I think that's right. Those may also be factored into whether you are using the right no-till system. For instance, some HOAs may be okay with a nice clean no-dig garden with wood chip mulched pathways, but maybe not so much with an operation as weird and wild as my own. To the untrained eye, and sometimes to the trained eye, this place can look absolutely bonkers. There may also be restrictions based on which state you're in, in terms of how much compost you can make on farm. That is a state-by-state -state thing, so you'll need to look that up if you plan on making bulk compost and importing a lot of raw materials. Uh, there's also zoning to consider. Checking these various regulations is also really important, especially when it comes to incorporating animals in any way. Just make sure you're not causing yourself more trouble down the line, or, you know, breaking any laws, which is not great. Lastly, I want to touch on goals. If your goal is to just add a garden to your already busy life, simplify your no-till system. Consider heavy mulches or even some landscape fabric to help block out weeds so that your job is mostly just go out after your long day of work and pick your tomatoes. As a commercial grower, I've got to constantly be thinking about setting up each garden bed for the next crop. If you are only concerned with getting one or maybe two crops per season out of a bed, then just focus on one very simple system that fits your budget. You don't need all the fancy gadgets and tools and the most expensive compost. You just need the right type of mulch for your region and warm enough weather to plant. Goals don't always have to be about money or time either. For us, one of the goals that drives our farm is ecology. I want to grow the number of insects and birds and animals in my area every year. So for us, having flowers and hedges and wild ecological areas is important to our system and to our farm. I also don't want to spend my time weeding. There is a bizarre amount of pushback against the idea of no-till sometimes because there are tillage systems that technically work fine at growing food and have for a long time. The difference is how much more those farmers have to work or how much more machinery they need to own or both. I used to be one of those farmers, and yes, I could successfully produce a crop tilling multiple times in a season, but I was also working until dark, cultivating weeds to do so, stomping around in muddy boots, breathing in my soil during the summer droughts. I had to fight a lot of disease and pests and weed pressure all the time for mediocre harvests. I just flat out refused to do that anymore. So I guess the last thing I'll say in this video is that if your current system is breaking you, is wearing you out, and costing you too much money, you are probably using the wrong system. Look at your context and adjust accordingly. Just because someone has success with a specific system in their region does not necessarily mean it'll translate to your farm, so it doesn't make you a failure if it didn't. Again, ask your farm what it needs and go from there. Anyway, heads up that if you would like to see my farm in person this spring and judge for yourself if it's bonkers, uh, we recently posted our farm field day events geared around specific topics. I'm assuming at this moment that they are not sold out uh, over at roughdraftfarmstead.com. I will post a link in the show notes. Hopefully those tickets are still there. Pick up a copy of the Living Soul Handbook from notillgrowers.com for more on these systems that I discussed or a hat or other merch. Join our Patreon page at patreon.com slash notillgrowers to support more videos like this. Or just hit that super thanks button. That works too. Like this video if you like this video. If you're not subscribed to the channel, hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, well, you're awesome. Otherwise, thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. I think I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> Woo.